Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Jason Dremay, the president of the Bipartisan Policy Center. It is a pleasure with our partners at uh, the National League of Cities and National Association of Counties to welcome you to today's event. So for about the last 20 years, infrastructure investment's been the best idea that just didn't happen. And so it is with some, I think, a righteous exuberance and excitement that we come together to talk about implementing the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. It is not hyperbole to say that this is a generational opportunity to strengthen our transportation, our broadband and our water systems, to accelerate the commercialization of the breakthrough technologies we need to address climate change, who can also boost competitiveness and devote long overdue attention to disadvantaged communities and make sure that these investments are actually disproportionately advantageous to the communities who have not been given the appropriate attention in the past. Success is going to demand exceptional collaboration between all levels of government, government and the private sector, and also an opportunity to resolve our differences in a way that is transparent, equitable, and really fast. And so with that acknowledgement, I think we all come together with some understanding that while our heads should be held high, having suffered the ridicule of many infrastructure weeks, we all have a little bit of accurate feeling of anxiety. I wouldn't quite say dread, but our dog has caught our car. And so the goal of um, this process is to really pull together. We're with people who are all rowing in the same direction. And so I think that gives us the opportunity to have a more forthright discussion of both our opportunities, but also some of our obstacles. I also wanna just kind of highlight that this is truly a bipartisan piece of legislation, right? Its genesis came out of the Environment and Public Works Committee when you know, Senator Barrasso was the chair. It had overwhelming bipartisan support in its design and its Senate. And this gives us, I think, a unique chance to kind of vindicate this shared national commitment to strengthening the country. So it is in that spirit that the Bipartisan Policy Center and National Association of Counties has decided to develop a series of events bringing together leaders from the administration with business leaders, state and local county government officials to really kind of dig into what the different questions and opportunities look like. And we are just delighted to kick off this uh, first event with Mayor Mitch Landrew. He is the proverbial uh, man with the plan. As everyone knows, uh, Mayor Landrew is a pragmatic doer who also knows how to talk to people. And one of the real key, I think, opportunities for the next several months is for us to all get together and talk stuff through. And so it is with uh, that, Mr. Mayor, that we'd love you to share your thoughts following uh, the mayor's remarks. We will have a panel discussion with his deputy, Samantha Silverberg, who with our partners at uh, NACO and uh, National Conference will dig a little deeper into some of the issues. But with that, Mr. Mayor, the Zoom is yours. Jason, thank you. Thank you so much. And Matt, it's great to see you and be with you and to my, my friend and my brother, Clarence Anthony. I appreciate you and the work of both the organizations as well as the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, the president sends his regards and his greetings to all of you. Uh, obviously, our thoughts and our prayers are with the Ukrainian people. And we recognize before we start this conversation that we're operating in a, in a much larger vacuum. Um, and I'm really pleased to be able to talk about something that uh, actually unites the country rather than divides us. When the president was running for office, he said that if elected, he would use the power of his presidency to bring the people together. Um, and his view, um, which is being borne out both on the domestic stage and on the international stage, is that we can't be strong abroad if we're not strong at home. And one of the most important things that we can do in this country uh, in order to be strong at home is to invest in ourselves. Uh, and not just in human capital, but in hard things called infrastructure. And as Jason said, everybody on, on this call has scars of how many conversations with how many presidents and congresses that we really have to invest in our infrastructure because the deficit is just so uh, threatening to the future of the country that unless and until we did it, we really wouldn't have a chance. So President Biden showed up uh, and he made a promise and he kept a promise. He brought Congress together in a bipartisan way as Jason said, and we passed a $1.2 trillion infrastructure plan. Now, I'm clear, having been a mayor that rebuilt a city that it was devastated by a storm, that our infrastructure needs are far in excess of that. 
But this is a massive, life-changing amount of investment for us to really kickstart how we're going to rebuild this country and make ourselves strong again. So I'm going to kind of give you a, a 50,000 foot view and then turn it over to uh, my deputy, Samantha Silverberg and Matt and Clarence to talk through a lot of the details. But suffice it to say that this is a $1.2 trillion investment. Uh, it cuts across the entirety of the federal government. It can't happen in its implementation without the partnership of the state local governments, not-for-profits, faith-based organizations. Essentially, though, the bill, the bill is divided a couple of different ways. Um, about half of the money is, goes through the Department of Transportation, for ports, airports, roads, bridges, public transit, and things of that nature. The other half of that bill is split up amongst a, a, a number of different um, agencies on the federal level that, as Jason said, deals with climate through the Department of Energy or broadband, through the Department of Commerce and uh, Agriculture and Interior. It deals with actually um, cleaning the air and the water in this country that everybody is entitled to through EPA. And Administrator Michael Regan has done an incredible job, along with Secretary Holland from the Department of Interior, about using this money to clean up orphan well sites, to clean up abandoned mine lands that were left by coal, to clean up uh, wastewater treatment um, in neighborhoods that have been forgotten for a long period of time. So whether it's access to high-speed internet, whether or not it's new hydrogen hub programs to move us towards clean energy, whether or not it's dealing with the tribal lands, this $1.2 trillion cuts across every facet of federal government. The president brought me in to try to help organize this with a whole of government approach and then actually to get it done. So as uh, the president's point person in this, I've been given the authority to convene all of the cabinet secretaries, which tomorrow will make our 10th meeting where all of the cabinet secretaries are working together to create like a one-stop shop. Um, my team has produced a book that you guys can find at build.gov that outlines every program that's actually in this $1.2 trillion bill. Now, I, I call this horizontal and vertical integration. So we're gonna spend our time in Washington, D.C., pulling all the cabinet secretaries together, staying focused, making ourselves available to NACO, making ourselves available to N NLC, making ourselves available to the U.S. Conference of Mayors, really trying to help people figure out how up in Washington, D.C., we're going to coordinate our activity so that we can move it down to the ground. But I've also asked all of the governors on behalf of the president to appoint an infrastructure coordinator. And then I've also asked the mayors to do that. So now you can begin to scope out how the actual implementation of this thing will work, because if you don't have coordination, collaboration, communication, you can't get it done. And here's the reason why. 90% of this money is going to be spent by governors and mayors. So I've split this up for you once, 1.2 trillion, half gone to transportation, a half to everybody else in all of the subject matter areas that I spoke about. I want to divide it up another way for you. About half of it, 55, 60%, is going to be formula funds. What that means in real words is that it's gone to the governors through pipelines that have already been previously established in traditional funding sources that the governors will then negotiate with their state legislators, hopefully in partnership with their senators and the congressmen in an effort to try to create priorities because you can't fund everything. And so it's really important that on the, on the state level that all of the communities get together and think about what are the roads, what are the bridges, where is the broadband going to be laid? Where are we going to lay the electrical vehicle charging stations? Not waiting on the federal government. And then they have to work with their mayors and their counties and their communities and their tribal leaders to get on the same page to the extent that they can. Also, um, the other half of the money that we talked about are going to be through what we call competitive grants. That means that every political subdivision, ports, airports, tribal communities, counties, and governors are going to be able to compete for these particular amounts of money. Now, both of those sets of dollars are in this resource book that we have talked about for a long time. So this book is gonna tell you what to apply for, how to apply for it, when to apply for it. Now, my team hit the ground running in the last 110 days, which is where we are. We've pushed out about $110 billion down to the state. So when people ask me, when is this stuff happening? The answer is right now. So we really can't wait to get ourselves organized and to get ourselves focused. There are 375 programs in this bill, 125 of them are brand new. So if you're thinking about this a little bit, some of this money is gonna go out fast. Some of it's gonna take some time because we have to build things like the new Office of Energy um, in the Department of Energy, like the new 
uh, although it's existed before, really kind of blowing out the minority development business um, office in the Department of Commerce to make sure that we build generational wealth in partnership with the SBA. All of these details are in that resource book that we talked about. Um, as I come to a close, I do want to say this, that the president uses words very intentionally. And so you can see that the way we talk about this bill is to build a better America. The building part that we talked about already is critically important, but the better part, Jason, is, is equally important to the president because his vision of what is a better America is critically important. And the president believes that a, a united nation, a cohesive nation, a nation that has economic growth and a nation that is preparing itself to win the 21st century has to be better. We're not putting it back like it was. And better to him looks like making sure that everything that we do takes into consideration everybody that should be seen in America. And we use the term equity broadly to describe this. This is not just about race, although it is about it. It's not just about class, although it is about it. It's not just about geography. The whole point is that we have to make sure that these dollars are used to make sure that we see people that have been left behind brought into the economy in a real and thoughtful way. So every one of these programs ought to have an equity lens on it. That's what better means to this president. Better also means that we ought to make sure that everything that we build is built with stuff that's made in America. Now, for years, as you know, we have exported all of our manufacturing capabilities and we have kind of left ourselves vulnerable um, to other nations. The president wants to find some way to create independence um, and make sure that we build stuff with American made products and use the money that's in this bill to create a whole new industrial agenda. And as you've seen in the last couple of weeks, if you've been paying attention, this is actually paying tremendous dividends because it's sending a market signal and GM and Ford and Tritium and Intel are all responding now and opening up manufacturing plants in states in the United States of America, creating very high paying jobs that make a lot of sense. So better for the president is equity. Better for the president is using products that are made in America. Better for the president also means making sure that we have high paying jobs, preferably from his perspective, union jobs. He thinks that the middle class built America, as he said, from the bottom up and the center out, not from the top down. And that when the middle class has built America, unions have helped build the middle class. And so to the extent possible, he wants to make sure that we have good job protections, we have good wages, we have an opportunity to lift everybody up, which we're asking labor to do as well, to reach down and to pull diverse communities into the labor market as well. So better means good paying jobs as well. And finally, better for the president means understanding that climate is an existential threat. I don't think that we really have to argue about this anymore. When you think about the wildfires and the hurricanes, and the storms that are coming our way, we have to build back in a way that actually makes us resilient and sustainable, and, and, and sustainable so that we actually are prepared to, to, uh, to beat back all of the things that are happening and then to completely rebuild um, the way that we actually produce things so we have a carbon-free environment. So when the president says build back and better, both of those things go hand in hand in order to do one thing, make America strong, make America prosperous, give everybody a chance to build generational wealth, which essentially will position America to win the 21st century with and against anybody that dares to compete with us. That's the big vision of the bill. That's why, without um, exaggerating, saying this is a once in a generation opportunity, but it's just an opportunity. And if we don't take advantage of it, if we don't partner together, if we don't coordinate, collaborate, we could waste this opportunity and put ourselves in a position that we're all gonna be unhappy with. I'm very excited about it because not only do I think that we're capable of doing it, I think we're up to the task. It's gonna be um, up to all of us to make sure that we stay focused, that as I say, keep our heads down and pound sand until we actually see all of these fantastic things coming out of the ground and actually giving our communities and the people that we represent the tools they need to sustain their families and to build generational wealth and to make America the strong country and the beautiful country that we know she has always been and that she will always be. So I thank you all um, for being partners with us. The president is really pumped up about this. He's excited about it. Um, it is something that he has been talking about for his entire political life. Um, and now we've been able to deliver and we're ready to get the job done. So thanks so much. I appreciate the time. Mr. Mayor, um, really appreciate you laying out kind of the administration's broad framework. I think we also strongly have uh, 
agreement around the idea that you know, here's an opportunity for shared success and shared accountability. And if I can speak on behalf of the thousand people on the call, you have a lot of partners out there. And so Excellent. we are obviously going to continue this discussion and really want to find ways that we can you know, forthrightly figure out you know, where are there obstacles that we have to overcome together. Because well, Jason, I would just add to this. I would not, sh I invite um, constructive uh, counsel, um, constructive criticism. Um, if you come with a problem, as, as a, one of my old uh, mentors, who is Father Harry Thompson, used to say, come with a solution too. Um, and let's just figure out how to get it done sooner, better, and faster uh, for all of us. So I welcome you all. Um, we need you all. All of you are our partners, and we want to drive this to the ground to create a, a better America. So thanks so much. Thank you. So we are now going to move to our second panel. If I describe Mayor Landrew as the man with the plan, I now want to put undue pressure on Samantha Silverberg by saying she is the woman with all the answers. We have a, a great opportunity for the next you know, 20, 25 minutes to have a conversation among three of the leaders in this discussion. First, colleague and friend, uh, Matt Chase, who is the CEO of the National Association of Counties. Matt has had that job for a decade and his eyes still sparkle when the words collaborative federalism get mentioned in casual conversation. So Matt, we appreciate uh, your energy and your durability. Also joined by uh, Clarence Anthony. Um, Clarence is now the CEO of the National League of Cities. He is someone who truly understands the meaning of rubber meeting road as he was mayor for 24 years of uh, South Bay, Florida. And now I think gives us that kind of real world local sense of what it's gonna to take to get this all done. And so I think now, Matt, I'll probably turn it over to you to start this discussion and appreciate everybody's time. Well, thank you, Jason. And we're really honored to be joined with Samantha Silverberg, who's the Deputy Infrastructure Chief at the White House. And it really has been working on the nuts and bolts of this program. So we're gonna dive right in and we're gonna really use this time wisely to hear from Samantha. I want to extend my appreciation quickly to Jason and the Bipartisan Policy Center and, of course, to the Biden administration for your partnership in the National League of Cities. So, Samantha, infrastructure is a classic example of the intergovernmental partnership between federal, state, local, and tribal officials, where we often have to blend our financial resources. A lot of the infrastructure is actually owned at the state, local, and tribal level with the federal government being an essential partner for setting the policy framework. And of course, in this case, providing a record level of federal investment. So can you talk to us a little bit about the best way that we can utilize this intergovernmental partnership to successfully implement the bipartisan infrastructure law? And as we talk about this, we also recognize that the private sector is gonna be essential in this collaboration whether it's dealing with the supply chain, helping us with the workforce development needs, and maybe even putting additional financing into the mix. So could you talk to us a little bit about the intergovernmental partnership, as well as the, the role that the private sector should be playing in this historic opportunity? Sure. Um, thanks, uh, Matt and Jason. Good to see you, Clarence. And, and thank you so much, everyone, for, for having us here. Um, as Matt mentioned, I'm, I'm Mitch's deputy, and I've, I've been at the White House for about a year. And before that, I was actually a local transit official. Um, so I understand uh, your, your experience as a grantee. Um, and a big part of what I try to bring to my, my work here is, again, bringing that kind of bottom-up experience of, of what it's like to be on the other end of, of, the, of the relationship. And so, as I, as I think Mitch mentioned, 90% of the resources in this bipartisan infrastructure law will be delivered by non-federal partners. So that's states, cities, counties, towns, nonprofits, universities, uh, private entities, port authorities, transit authorities, and others. And so this partnership, this collaboration that Matt speaks to is so unbelievably important. Uh, the federal government here, you know, we will be the primary funder, we will be the oversight partner, we will be the regulator, we will hopefully be the one also getting out of the way, breaking down barriers. But ultimately, uh, this, this work is going to be delivered by folks on the ground. I also like to think about this as a great national project. Uh, we have not rebuilt or built our infrastructure at this level in many, many, many decades. You know, sometimes this law gets compared to the investment made for the interstate highway system. 
Uh, that was a certainly a, a historic and significant investment in transportation, but I would actually argue that we have not made a cross-sector investment like this, likely since the New Deal, right? We are talking about investments in transportation, in water, in broadband, in clean energy, in resilience, uh, every single sector of physical infrastructure that you can think about. And so much of the collaboration that needs to happen is not just between the federal government, the state government, and local governments, but also across the different silos within each of those governments. So Matt, to your point of what can folks do to, to prepare and be ready and execute on this historic uh, investment, I would say first get organized. Um, you know, we have asked uh, states to appoint infrastructure coordinators. Uh, many have, I think we're up to 26 states so far. Uh, we have also, uh, a part of that has been asking them to think about how they break down barriers and coordinate between, for example, state transportation offices, state energy offices, uh, and, and state broadband offices. We want to see that same kind of integration also at the local level. And so obviously, you know, different communities have different levels of resources. We can't ask every city, town, and county to appoint infrastructure coordinator. But I would ask you to think very seriously about how you build that kind of, uh, in Mitch's words, horizontal and vertical integration. How you think holistically about how, for example, your roads, your water pipes, and your broadband might all get built at the same time. How you think about the energy needs for your electric vehicle charging and how that plans into your fleet procurements for the rest of your agencies. And it, if we're going to be as transformative as we want to be in these investments, we really have to think holistically. And so thinking about that is, is a really good place to start. So that's kind of top down. On the bottom up side, um, as Mitch has mentioned, we published a, a guidebook on our website, build.gov, which includes a, a, a relatively simple interface uh, of one page entry on every single program in the bipartisan infrastructure law. It's about 375 programs in total. There's also a, a downloadable spreadsheet. Um, so communities can take that data and sort it uh, in different ways. If you're only interested in broadband, you can look at it that way. If you're only interested in programs that are that are uh, available to local communities, you can look at it that way. And so that's one way to get ready, kind of understanding and digging into the meat of the bill. And then again, the other piece is really starting to get yourself organized so that you can think holistically and collaboratively across different silos within your within your organization. Well, Sam, thank you so much uh, for being here today and, and being a partner. It's great to hear uh, both you and Mayor Landrieu uh, talk about the opportunity that exists uh, for us to make a difference with this uh, piece of legislation, um, but also recognize that success is going to start on the ground up. Um, can you tell me how the White House is working to engage local government in the implementation of the bipartisan infrastructure law? Absolutely. Well, one way is forums like this. Um, we have made ourselves available uh, to uh, USCM, uh, National League of Cities, National Governors Association, National Association of Counties, Lieutenant Governors, state budget officials. Uh, you know, we really see our local government partners as partners and as key stakeholders. And so we are, uh, we have a front door, we have an open door, and we want to be able to engage with you and hear from you and learn about what you're doing and also uh, how we can do our work better. So, so that's one piece kind of at the association level, also at the individual level. Um, you know, Mitch has spoken to now 43 governors, 53 mayors, 30 other county and state officials, and that's kind of on a one-on-one -on -one basis, not to mention his large addresses to the the plenary sessions of all of these big groups. Um, we, we now have set up monthly uh, uh, coordinators calls with the, the state infrastructure coordinators, and that's a, that's a work that we're doing in partnership with the National Governors Association. And I think as other entities get organized, we are, we are very happy to engage uh, other groups as well. Um, one thing that we launched uh, uh, around a month ago is what we're calling infrastructure school. And so uh, what that is, is a set of 12 webinars for stakeholders and local governments uh, to provide additional information about specific provisions in the bill. And what we're doing is we're going category by category so that we could talk through um, uh, the different provisions and opportunities uh, with with each uh, within each group. So we, we had a broadband session yesterday. I believe there was a, a road safety session, so on and so forth. Um, and then again, I'll, I'll I'll just say that we are we are an open door. Um, we want to hear from you all about what works, but I will also say we want to hear from you about what doesn't work. 
Um, I think we've had a lot of lessons learned over the years of federal, state, local partnership and engagement. Um, and we are here, as Mitch says, to build a better mousetrap, um, to, to kind of rebuild trust and relationships with our local partners, and then to work as collaboratively as possible to rebuild our great country. And Samantha, building on what you've been talking about, one, I want to applaud the Biden administration. Your build.gov has some great resources. Your guidebook is phenomenal if people take time to read it. You mentioned the 375 programs. So some of them are very narrowly focused. Some are broader. Some are existing programs and some are brand new. If you're at the local level or even a state, how how do they think about the application process? Meaning, is there one point of entry or do they have to apply program by program? How are they gonna figure out where does this specific project fit within those 375 programs? And maybe you can highlight just a little bit more that DOT has a significant amount of money, but there's also programs throughout the federal government. It's not just the US Department of Transportation can you talk a little bit about that? Like, how do they actually access the application process? Sure. Um, so uh, there are programs across 13 different departments and agencies. So the Department of Transportation does have a significant number of programs and especially discretionary grant programs. But there are also meaningful programs at, for example, the Environmental Protection Administration, the Department of Interior, the Department of Energy, the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, there's even programs at, at FEMA. Um, and other parts of the Department of Homeland Security. So it's really a very wide uh, ranging set of opportunities. Um, each program generally has different application requirements which are set in statute. That said, um, we are working with agencies to try to find more opportunities where we can uh, simplify processes. We want to make it easier for folks on the ground so that if you have a program or a project that might fit within multiple different grant programs, we'd like to make it possible where you can apply just once and have kind of a single point of entry to move into a, a variety of different grant, similar grant programs. And so uh, we are currently working with the Department of Transportation on this for some of their larger grant programs, uh, which is something that's hopefully coming out in the next couple of weeks. Um, we are also uh, talking to uh, a number of departments, uh, including the Interior Department, the Agriculture Department, um, and, uh, and, and the, the Commerce Department, the, the NOAA within Commerce, about potentially a, a single kind of request for a proposal for, for similar types of programs. I recently had a conversation with my Department of Energy colleagues similarly, uh, where if they have multiple small programs that state energy offices or other types of local utilities would all apply for? Is there a mechanism where we can have almost a, a common application, like you think about uh, in college, where you don't have to... Uh, fill out the same thing over and over again, or God forbid, pay a different consultant each time you need to submit your application. And so I would say we're in we're in early phases, Matt, of uh, uh, rebuilding those kind of processes, but it's something we're really focused on because we know that uh, the more that we can reduce administrative burden, the more that we can fed simplify federal processes, the more likely we are, one, to get really great projects, but then also, two, to make it easier, particularly for underserved and disadvantaged communities to access federal resources. So it's, it's a big priority. To your specific question about uh, how can different communities uh, know how to apply, um, we, we try to include as much of that information as possible in the guidebook, um, including uh, when there are, are, are upcoming deadlines. Uh, many of our agency colleagues are frequently hosting webinars. They have intergovernmental affairs contacts uh, that are engaging at a, at a regular basis uh, with mayors and counties and other local officials. And so, uh, you know, our team is very happy to be uh, a point of contact. Um, and then I would also encourage folks to reach out to individual agency uh, inter intergovernmental affairs teams as well. Thank you so much. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Clarence. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I, I really think I'd like to build a little bit on uh, probably the biggest challenge that uh, local governments are facing, and, and that is the ability uh, to respond uh, and get technical assistance. Um, especially for small and rural entities who are applying for the grants. Uh, many of these communities lack the human capacity and resources of tackling some of the critical funding questions and the, what they need to put in the application. 
Uh, Sam, can you discuss any new resources available uh, for federal agencies to provide uh, technical assistance? Because both NACO as well as NLC is ready to partner at any point with you to make sure that these funds are uh, applied for and implemented correctly. Yeah, thank you, Clarence. And uh, we this is, I would say, the most common question we get uh, and the most common request that we get um, is for uh, technical assistance, uh, support, uh, really along the entire life cycle of, of infrastructure. So yes, absolutely in the front end in terms of applying for funding and being able to access grants, but all the way through planning, design, construction, operations, really giving our communities the resources they need to deliver excellent infrastructure projects that meet their community needs. And so this is something we're thinking a lot about. Um, we've had a lot of conversations with uh, the philanthropic community as well to try to identify foundation dollars and other resources that might be available either at the community level or at the national level. In terms of federal resources, I can name a few. Um, uh, EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency or Administration, has something called the Treatment Works Program, which provides training and technical assistance to serve small rural and tribal communities as they develop uh, wastewater proposals. Uh, we were all, uh, I think, uh, really uh, struck by uh, some recent stories about Lowndes County, Alabama. Uh, EPA Administrator Regan actually went down there over the weekend to see this, this rural community where folks have uh, uh, raw sewage right in their backyards because they do not have, even in the year 2022, functioning wastewater systems. And so, you know, th this is something that we are focused on and this Treatment Works program is, is one of the ones that's available to help communities uh, build up that technical capacity. Um, FEMA has a program that many of you may know about called the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program or BRIC. Um, and through BRIC, um, they provide support to states for hazard mitigation projects. There's a focus on capacity building. And one of the things we've been hearing from our FEMA colleagues is how they engage with communities on the front end and really help them develop projects as well as go through the application process and then actually execute them. And they're also doing some interesting and innovative things to make their application process smoother, uh, like simplifying their cost benefit analyses um, and providing other mechanisms to standardize inputs. Um, one other program, the Department of Energy has a program called the Community Lead program, LEAP, which provides technical assistance for communities that are interested in clean energy projects. One of the things that we will likely be doing in the coming weeks and months is kind of pulling together a resource that collates all of these different technical assistance programs so that communities don't have to hunt and peck. And then one last thing I'll say, which is kind of new as of this morning, um, is that the omnibus deal, so the budget deal that was just publicized earlier, um, includes a new Department of Transportation program called the Thriving Communities Initiative, which is something that we had proposed in the budget um, and is focused on supporting uh, disadvantaged and underserved communities, uh, especially in terms of projects uh, that integrate transportation and housing, uh, because we know how critical it is for uh, how an interrelated transportation and housing can be. And so we're really excited that, that Congress uh, uh, enacted this, this brand new program that will be standing, uh, standing up over the coming months. And Samantha, throughout the, the infrastructure law, there are special carve-outs, particularly for rural communities. There are carve-outs for disadvantaged and underserved communities throughout the country, but there is some spotlight on rural areas throughout the bill. So I want to highlight that. But second, I want to move back to what Mayor Landry was talking about, where a significant portion of the money will flow through the states, particularly for traditional surface transportation programs. So transit agencies may receive the money directly through traditional formulas, but when we look at things like roads and bridges in particular, it really flows through the state DOTs. Can you talk a little bit about the different incentives or the different conversations that you all have had to encourage the governors and the state DOTs to work with locals? And if you could talk a little bit maybe about the bridge program incentives where you all have allowed to waive the local match when states partner with local governments. That is a great model of providing a financial incentive to get more projects done through these waivers. Matt, I'm so glad you asked about the bridge program. It's one of my favorites, and I think it's one of the president's favorites too. And so uh, for, for those who don't know, there's a total of 27.5 
uh, actually four, there's a total of $40 billion uh, for bridge investments in the bipartisan infrastructure law. 12.5 of that is for a discretionary competitive grant program that's primarily geared towards large, uh, large economically significant bridges uh, that heretofore have not been funded because they're just, they're so big, they're so meaty, and they would take so much of a community's resources in order to get done. And yet we know those are, act, uh, those are really critical bottlenecks to commerce. Um, the other $27.5 billion is for a new bridge formula program, um, which uh, the president announced uh, earlier in January. And uh, to Matt's point, one of the provisions of that law that we're really excited about is that um, it allows um, states to waive the cost share. So that means projects would be 100% federally funded for off-system bridges. What are off-system bridges? Off-system bridges are bridges that are not on the national highway system. So that means they are not on the interstate. They are not on other major roads. They're usually bridges that are owned by counties. They're owned by cities. They're owned by towns. And they don't have a dedicated source of federal funding the same way that the interstate does. And so when you look at our inventory of bridges that are in poor condition, the vast majority of them are actually these off-system bridges. And so because the bipartisan infrastructure law allows states to waive that cost share and dedicate 100% of the federal funds to those off-system bridges, it means they're going to get done sooner and they're going to get done uh, uh, in a way that's going to help communities. We sent the president to a bridge up in New Hampshire. It was a small town, but there was a fire station on one end and there was a logging company on the other. And that bridge was already weight posted, which meant that it was teetering on the edge of being closed. And if it got closed, those firefighters would have to detour significantly out of the way if they had to respond to an emergency in a community. And I imagine that all of you can think about your communities and where you live and a bridge that either is so old or it's so, it, it's, it's so decrepit that you know if that went out, it would be deeply inconvenient to your community. And so this is one we're really excited about. Um, Matt, I would also say uh, there's about, a, about, about about a third of programs in the in the law provide some amount of relief um, for matching funds for either for rural communities, for tribal communities, or for disadvantaged communities. And in particular, the vision there is that we don't want the match to be a barrier, particularly in the places of greatest need. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that. Um, uh, earlier this week, Administrator Regan and his team put out guidance for the state revolving funds, which are the, the primary mechanism for providing water infrastructure resources to communities. One of the things that's different this year is that 49% of those resources have to be provided to disadvantaged communities as forgivable loans or grants. So traditionally, the state revolving funds are a mechanism for low interest loans, which is a, a, in, in many cases a, a very effective mechanism for funding water systems. But what's new here, in part because of the administration's focus on disadvantaged communities and our Justice 40 commitment, is that for the first time ever, this 49% of the resources would be available either as forgivable loans or grants, uh, which we see as a, as a very strong mechanism to advance our, our equity goals. Sam, I want to Samantha, feel. thank you so much. I'm going to turn over to Clarence, but before I do, just real quick, I want to thank you for spotlighting the off-system bridges. I think because of the technical term off-system bridges, people think these often aren't significant, but almost all of our trips start and stop and end on these off-system bridges, including our agricultural produce, mm -hmm. fuel and fiber, and really a lot of our natural resources. So they're really important. I just want to thank you for highlighting that. I'll turn it over to Clarence. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Matt on that. And, and I'll also add that both uh, NLC and NACO were very uh, interested and concerned about uh, the job opportunities that exist uh, with the uh, uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill. And so we are recognizing all over America and local communities, uh, there's a worker shortage and it's showing up across the country, especially in the infrastructure sector. With all of the jobs that will be needed, how can we make sure that we have the skilled workforce uh, to rebuild infrastructure in uh, local communities? Because I think that that is something that uh, Mayor Landrieu uh, spoke about and the president is talking about. I want to make sure we got a chance to hear uh, about how we can work with you to make sure that jobs are created and their skills available, skilled employees available. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's a great question, Clarence, and it's another one that's, I think, come up in a lot of our discussions and conversations. Um, and, and just last week, the president's remarks in the State of the Union laid out some of our thinking here. And so how we're thinking about workforce needs. Uh, first, we need to expand skills-based hiring. Uh, we need to increase access to registered apprenticeships and training, which is something we're working very closely with our labor colleagues on. Um, expanding access for educational opportunities for, for low-income students, that includes investing in HBCUs and MSIs, um, supporting paycheck fairness, and other paid family and medical leave to get women and parents back in the workforce. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen the statistics about uh, how many women have had to drop out of the workforce during the pandemic uh, to care for family members. Um, uh, you know, paying competitive wages, President feels uh, very strongly that uh, uh, good jobs uh, with good wages will be filled. And keeping schools open is another mechanism to kind of get folks back and available in the workforce. You know, we, we've addressed the pandemic and, and Americans are getting back to work. And we're really leading the way the federal government um, and the vast majority of federal workers are, are coming back to work. Um, I'm, in, I'm in the office here in the White House right, right now, and, and many of my colleagues are as well. Um, you know, I also want to note that um, there's a really wide variety of jobs that are going to be needed to deliver the infrastructure bill. We, we talk a lot about the types of um, uh, building trades and, and hand on, hands-on work, um, plumbers and pipe fitters, communications workers, electricians, uh, obviously laborers and other construction workers, but it really goes all the way into um, engineers, project managers, uh, uh, budgeteers, uh, I started my career as a, as, a, as a budget as a budget person, and so I would really you know think about all the programs that you have in your community, um, from uh, uh, community colleges all the way into the kind of K to 12 pipeline. Because again, this is going to be a great national project that's going to take us many years to see to completion. And and our hope is that success begets success. And so as we show that we can do this, we can build this muscle memory. There'll be more to come. Um, I'll just say a few more things specifically about infrastructure, um, which is that we're working very very closely alongside our, our labor, labor unions who we talk to on a regular basis, um, state and federal workforce agencies, including the Department of Labor, who's a member of our infrastructure implementation task force, um, uh, industry, um, and other partners to make sure we're filling jobs that we're creating, um, working with unions to bolster apprenticeship programs, um, or asking companies and states to invest in workforce training programs so that we can create good jobs for underrepresented communities. And then there are also some very specific workforce programs that are invested in the bill. Um, if, for example, on some of the key environmental remediation programs uh, that we're creating jobs that can reskill workers for the future. Uh, one of the programs the president loves talking about um, is our Orphan Wells program program and our abandoned mine lands program, where we are actually looking to uh, reskill uh, the very workers who dug those wells and mines to cap them and clean them up. And so it's a virtuous cycle where we're creating good jobs in those very communities and also helping folks uh, transition and prepare for a clean energy future. Samantha, I just Thanks have one last question before we turn over to Jason, and that is, you really did a great job of highlighting the human impact that so many times we think of infrastructure as the end and really it's a means to an end for enhanced mobility, for better quality of life, to, to move goods. Can you just talk really quickly in 60 seconds about how can state and local governments, the private sector and others help tell the story of the impact of these investments so that Congress and the American people see they get a good return on the investment and really, what, what can we do to help tell that story? Really helpful, Matt. So um, Mitch uh, and the president both are, are very passionate about human stories. So I think it's really meaningful when you can speak about a fire station that's on a bridge, uh, when you can talk about a child uh, who can't access their remote school or a senior who can't access telemedicine because there isn't reliable high-speed internet. You could speak about a school that doesn't have access to clean water that relies on, on, on bottled water because uh, of, of either environmental contamination or lead. You know, those human stories I think are so powerful when you can associate a, a real person who is right now suffering and will one day benefit. So, so on the one side, I would talk about the human stories. On the other side, I think, you know, you're, you're feeling and hearing a lot about prices and about how, how prices and costs are impacting families. And so I think the other argument that's very compelling 
is talking about how investment in infrastructure supports our supply chains, how investment in infrastructure is pro-growth, how it supports our economy. Um, there's, I think, a lot of good research on this, but it's also meaningful, I think, to speak about it at the community level and the local level about how, uh, you know, such and such an investment will allow goods to get to market faster. It will alleviate congestion. It will support uh, uh, attracting more uh, high value businesses and individuals to our community. So I would say, you know, go with the kind of the heart wrenching uh, personal stories, but then also let's think about the kind of hard economic argument as well. Hey, Matt, well, I, want me, to uh, thank, I want to thank you and Jason for inviting me to this conver important conversation on an important issue. Uh, I love my partnership with NACO, and uh, we're in this together to make sure that the uh, legislation is successful. So thanks, Matt and Jason. Well, let me offer a, a final frame of thank yous. Um, I want to thank our nation's infrastructure coordinator and our nation's deputy infrastructure coordinator. And in doing so, reflect a little bit on these brand new titles in our government structure. You know, I think it causes me to think about two of my favorite quotes. Uh, first is uh, Ronald Reagan saying the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm the government and I'm here to help. And so I think it is really important to see how focused you know, the administration is on really trying to turn that premise around. The second is Oscar Wilde's quote, which is that the problem with communism is too many meetings because every aspect of this bill is urgent. Investing in disadvantaged communities is urgent. Fixing our bridges is urgent. Commercializing and scaling the world's most significant climate reducing technologies is urgent. And so how we balance these two ideas, how we balance process and engagement and inclusion and speed, you know, we at the Bipartisan Policy Center think is really the kind of core of the both problem and opportunity. It is with that that I again invite everybody to share um, their ideas and their thoughts. There are many, many different discussions going on, so I don't want to pretend that this is the only one, but we are certainly committed to trying to be effective. And then my last, last thought is that if the real challenge is storytelling, I think Mayor Landrieu and President Biden are probably going to get that job done. So we can maybe end on that aspect of confidence in our nation's leaders. Thank you all very much. We will uh, be in touch.